life. Yeah. So we gonna give you upbeat music now. Are we blessed today? Are we blessed? Are we blessed? Let me hear you. Okay. You know, there's a story that goes like this. There was a wino. I heard him say, I don't go to a church. I ain't got no Bible. But I'm truly blessed. I want it to me.
occasion is to celebrate. Oh, I can get loud, brother. I can tell you that. <laughs> the occasion is to celebrate, to affirm, to honor, to, to give our love to a great pioneer. And so we come on this occasion, even though he's dead, we know that Randy's spirit is around somewhere, touching us. <laughs> in that, in light of that, we're going to follow the program as it is printed, and we're not going to go through a lot of introductions, etc., etc., etc. We will follow the program as printed. Thank you. I'm glad you're all here. I'm trying to represent all the folks who worked with Randy, loved him, thought about him, tried to be as good a reporter as he was and remained right up until the time he died. When he came to the Chronicle, the Chronicle about 12 years ago, we quickly learned two things about him. He was grinning all the time, and he was a tough reporter. He also knew what he wanted to cover, and by being a pain in the neck sometimes, he forced the editors to let him cover it, and he did from the very beginning. I worked with him because I cover science, so I was into retrovirology and things like that, and Randy was out in the street and in the community and causing some trouble, but reporting it accurately, fairly, competently, often brilliantly. He made friends, and many of you know that he made some enemies too, because he called the shots the way he knew they existed, and he wasn't afraid to report honestly every minute of his working life, and his waking life too, and I suppose when he was asleep. My best memory of Randy was at the 1989 International AIDS Conference in Montreal. We went up there together, and uh, we decided that we were going to cover it together. 
And what we'd do is every morning, shortly before 7 o'clock, we'd meet downstairs at the hotel, compare notes, look over the program, try to decide what we were going to cover that day. And there was never a moment of doubt in his mind or in mine as to where his sphere lay and my sphere lay and where they intersected. And uh, he went out and did one hell of a job. At the very end, as we were uh, wrapping up our reporting one day toward the end of the conference, we were sitting in this terribly crowded press room. We each had our little, we called them trash 80s, laptop, uh, cheap, needless to say, laptop computers. And we sat side by side. He was writing and I was writing. And the hubbub was absolutely unbelievable. And I turned around to try to shut these people up. They were all Randy's fan club. These guys were all around him, and they were clapping him on the back. And I said, for God's sakes, Randy, will you shut these guys up? I'm trying to write a story. You're trying to write a story. Randy said, I can write a story under any circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> he did. At the end of that conference, the people who organized the conference asked Randy to be the closing speaker, because by then, 1989, he was indeed a pioneer. And I remember two things, and I wrote them down, that came out of the, the talk he gave. This is what he said, not sparing anybody. He said to the scientists there, whom he'd already made uncomfortable many times, you in science are not getting hundreds of millions of dollars in government money simply because you look so fabulous in your white coats. He said, you're getting that money because you're supposed to produce under the deadline pressure that the epidemic demands. Any solution to the HIV infection that comes only after most HIV infected people are dead will not be relevant science. But he also, he also had something else to say because he wasn't sparing anybody. There'd been lots and lots of anger and rage expressed. Speakers were interrupted often. There were demonstrations on the floor. And this is what Randy said. Venting your anger can give you a warm, fuzzy feeling inside, but this conference is not a therapy session. It is not enough to be angry if anger is not paired with intelligence, with tactical timing, and the best strategic targets. Well, some scientists squirmed, and some in the ACT UP crowd hissed him. But when he finished, that convention hall just burst into applause, and Randy loved every minute of it. He was a journalist with a mission. He filled both roles superbly, but he also loved the way his own role was being played out on a public stage. And he was a great guy and a great reporter, and those of us at the Chronicle loved him. First of all, I would say it's great to be back in Glide. After so many years, it's great to know and to see that it's more diverse, noisier, and friendly than I remember. <laughs> Cecil Williams is a kinder, gentler, and more forgiving man than I am, and I hope he will forgive me one comment about the Reverend Phelps. The Reverend came to San Francisco to, quote, shadow these people like some sort of ugly dog. That is, of course, the kind of statement I would expect from a son of a bitch. I hope Cecil forgives me my pun because, because Randy was more than a friend, he was a hero to me. Now one of the requirements of a hero is courage. And anybody who holds a coming out party in their college sociology class <laughs> has to have courage. <laughs> 
Actually, three reporters have been heroes of mine. One was William Shire, who wrote The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich and risked his life reporting the truth about Nazi Germany. The second was Don Bowles. Don and I worked on my college paper together. Later he was murdered reporting on crime and corruption in Arizona. The third was Randy. While in a hospital bed, he fought to finish Conduct Unbecoming, a book chronicling the homophobia and persecution that gays faced in the military. He was incensed that his government expected gays to die for it, but also expected those same gays to live their lives in shame and silence. Randy considered himself a journalist, first, last, and always. We sometimes forget that journalism is a profession, and like all professions, it has its standards. One is to report the truth without bias or favor. The second is to search out injustice and do all in our power to correct it. Randy more than lived up to those standards. He was a relentless interviewer, a persistent digger after facts, and wrote stories portraying the truth as he saw it. He knew his stories might offend friends as well as foes, but he would not stretch the truth, nor would he ignore it. Like any good reporter, Randy became an ombudsman for his community. He was outraged by the murder of Harvey Milk and wrote a book not only about Harvey's life, but about a justice system that had fermented from the eating of too many Twinkies. Randy was outraged by a government that refused to appropriate the funds to find the cure for a disease afflicting thousands of its citizens. In an attempt to uphold its own twisted standards of morality, that government let them die. It came as no surprise to Randy that that same government had performed medical experiments on its citizens without their knowledge or consent. Randy fought to finish his last book while in the hospital fighting the effects of a collapsed lung. Gays in the military was an important issue, and Randy believed that a book exposing homophobia in the services would make a difference. He shortened his own life in an effort to make that difference. Randy had his detractors within the gay community. I sometimes wonder if they realized how much he loved it, how hard he fought to fight the injustices that had been done it. He eventually became famous and relatively rich, and there were those who resented that as well. But his fame and minor fortune came after the fact. The truth is that the mayor of Castor Street was a labor of love. The advance for the book was minor. Randy could have made more money waiting table. To be able to write and the band played on Randy had to keep his full-time job at the Chronicle and work on his book at nights and on the weekends. The truth is that almost every book Randy wrote was a result of sweat, an overwhelming sense of injustice, and a deep desire to change the world for the better. More than any other reporter I ever knew, he succeeded in doing that. The Reverend Phelps doesn't think that Randy should be held up as a role model for American youth. The truth is, you couldn't possibly find a better one. sound of the crowd outside sounds so great when we know, know it's our crowd. I have to begin by I have to begin by departing a little bit from the judgment of Cecil and Frank on the parson from Topeka. First the comparison to uh, a dog 
my dog, Randy's dog, and I think all dogs in this country <laughs> don't appreciate the comparison. <laughs> so let Buddy and uh, Dash know that I defended their <laughs> reputation. The other was uh, Cecil on television the other night said, you know, some of these people, they're very close to the edge of being mentally disturbed. <laughs> That's another disagreement I have. <laughs> Nothing about that guy that's close to the edge. <laughs> He's way over the top. I'm sorry to say this has been a very difficult week in many ways because I regret to announce the death last night of George Mendenhall. friend to us all and uh, I wrote many years for the gay press um, so we've lost two good journalists excuse me not for crying no, I'm not I'm not apologizing for crime I cr I'm, I'm apologizing for taking the time yeah don't worry about it just take your time um, <laughs> Randy Schultz felt he could best serve our community by adhering to the highest professional standards of journalism. He knew, he knew he would be held to those standards by many in commercial journalism who had no standards at all and embraced the shoddy infotainment that marks our times. He always took on tasks that otherwise wouldn't be tackled. So did I. I met Randy in 1976. I had just assembled a score of top California labor leaders to speak out for gay rights at a news conference. It got terrific coverage from the media. Randy was new to town. He came by my apartment afterwards and did a story for the advocate. Later that night, I ran into a prominent gay leader who accused me of selling out gays to the labor movement. A few months later, I and others who began fighting for the rights of gays within the military came under vicious personal attack from within the movement. Some activists had trouble seeing how we could fight militarism and defend GIs at the same time. We didn't. Years later, when Randy's stories began sounding the alarm about AIDS and the bathhouse controversy erupted, he was assailed in the same personal way, in a painful way, as a sellout and even as a sexual fascist. My empathy with Randy came easily, even when I disagreed with him. How should we honor Randy's memory? By canonizing him or romanticizing his image? I don't think so. First of all, his books remain a sturdy monument to his life. They deserve critical appreciation from future generations of activists and scholars. I believe we honor Randy by showing a greater mutual respect toward each other by not exaggerating differences to the point of totally invalidating someone because they have a different position, by expressing differences without overreacting and defaming others, by not allowing the government to pit us against each other and divide us. For instance, must we turn purple with rage over whose turf will be awarded some often powerless patronage position? Randy's memory will be honored when workers within our community institutions receive union job protections and an end to racial discrimination, and especially when writers for the gay and, and lesbian press can write honestly without being fired or censored. We'll honor, we'll honor Randy when we all march together more than a million strong at the upcoming Stonewall 25 march on the UN. <laughs> Finally, we live in a time when corporate greed and compulsive personal competitiveness dominate our national life. We need a new infusion of the defiant, egalitarian, and loving spirit 
that gave birth to gay pride and gay liberation. We need a strong progressive coalition as never before. If we join hands with health care coalitions statewide to put the California Health Security Act on the ballot, we'll make a major step in that direction. <laughs> we will also make national history. And there are now hundreds of gay and lesbian journalists following in Randy's footsteps, ready to record that history. In my view, then, we best honor Randy Schultz not with passive sediment, but with positive, bold, and loving action, both social and personal. Thank you. So that everybody might know, outside and inside, the Reverend Fred Phelps has come and the Reverend Fred Phelps has gone. He undoubtedly was too uncomfortable with San Francisco. Randy Schultz was one of the truly great journalists of our time because the issues he chose to report on were gay topics the world has only belatedly begun to appreciate this fact. His career was a shining example of what journalism at its best can be and can accomplish. And I also think he will be an important role model for aspiring journalists for decades to come. From the first time I met Randy in the mid-70s, I was struck by his obvious and total commitment to journalism, its principles and its ethos. Along with his boyish charm and ebullient energy, he displayed what seemed to me an almost naive belief in journalism as a profession, as Mark Weber might have put it, which struck me as very Californian, very Lincoln Stephan. It has been a great pleasure, as well as an object lesson to me, to watch as he carried out this belief in action over the last 15 years and proved that it wasn't naive at all though it was indeed idealistic. From the time he left journalism school and accepted a job at The Advocate against the advice of friends who warned that it would kill his career, he has proven that idealism can still change the world, in this case, the world of professional journalism. But make no mistake, by his example, Randy Schultz helped to change the face of journalism in America. Randy's career is neatly summarized in his book, in the late 70s, when he became the first openly gay reporter on a major metropolitan daily, he was convinced that the emergence of the gay community, which he could concretely observe in the Castro, would become a major national news story. Everybody thought he was crazy, but that local reporting about what was happening in San Francisco became his first book, The Mayor of Castro Street, The Life and Times of Harvey Milk. In the early 80s, when he fought to cover the AIDS story full time, again, people thought he was crazy. But of course, that reporting led to and the band played on. In the late 80s, when he began to investigate the situation of gays and lesbians in the military, even Randy thought a book on the topic might be uh, a little iffy. Since at the time, five or six years ago, he couldn't imagine a lot of people being interested in the subject. And we talked about it back and forth for a good long time. But he could not resist what he thought was one of the best stories around, one that captured what was happening both to the gay movement and to America, and one that nobody else was covering. Looking at our society through the prism of the military, Randy was convinced would yield a definitive analysis of homophobia in America while addressing the broader issue of the state of freedom in our supposedly free society. 
And once again, his intuition about what would be a good story, a story that would capture what was happening to his community and to his country, was sound. In the last interview Randy gave to 60 Minutes a few weeks ago, Randy suggested that one could summarize his career by saying that like any successful journalist, he had simply been at the right place, at the right time, with the right instincts. But I would add to that a couple of other qualities. Independence of mind and the courage to pursue the truth and let the chips fall where they may. Randy has taken a lot of flack over the years from those, including a good number of my friends, who believed that public relations for the gay and lesbian community was more important than getting the story right. But Randy Schultz was always clear about the fact that he was a gay journalist and not a gay activist. And if journalism is going to be more than a job, if journalism is going to be a profession in Mark Weber's sense, then it must be grounded in the commitment to the truth and energized by a faith that the truth can indeed change the world. Yes, this is idealism, but after 15 years of watching Randy at work, I am convinced that such idealism is not at all naive, but on the contrary, totally necessary. Describe him adequately. I have to talk about his work because that's what defines him for us, and that's his legacy for us. I've known Randy for 18 years. He came to my office first for background information for a one hour crash course in virology, bacteriology, pathology. He was writing his first article on intestinal diseases among the gay community. It was this one in the Advocate in the winter of 1976. If I were giving him a grade in medical school, I would have given him an A on that. I mean that. He reported what I taught him. He reported what he learned about New York cases from Dr. Dan William. He reported on Chicago cases from Dr. Dave F. Ostro from L.A. by Dr. Michael Gottlieb. He was talking to all of them. He put it all together in a meaningful article, and it was a warning because he labels it a plague on our houses, gastrointestinal diseases, and he was warning the gay community that what they were doing, the way they were doing it, was just going to cause them real misery. We didn't know how much misery because at that time already AIDS was in the community but it was incubating and it hadn't showed up. This was 76. Late in 76, he came to me for another crash course on hepatitis. He was reporting on his own case of hepatitis. And that's this one from The Advocate, January of 77. He called it hepatitis doesn't come from needles. It's sexually transmitted, it's a killer, it's epidemic, and it's a decade's best kept medical secret. He had four pages of it, and it was even better than his GI story. Later, he had another one with me on amoebiasis, amoebic dysentery. I don't have a copy of it. It's lost in my file someplace. But in all of these, he was sending out a warning that this was concentrated among the gay men in the gay community in San Francisco to a lesser degree, or it wasn't known as well, in New York, in Chicago, in Los Angeles, in Dallas, in some other enclaves of gay population. However, his, his warning was that it seems to be sexually transmitted. He was a good student, a quick study, and he reported accurately. Everything I knew that I read in his books and his articles that I knew personally was accurate. Now, since all of these were happening in the gay community, and then AIDS appeared in late 81 in San Francisco with different diagnoses in the gay men, 
it was still the same population, it still appeared the same way, we had to think, is this another sexually transmitted disease? Randy now was writing on the Chronicle. In our office, and I reported to him, he was on the phone all the time or visiting in the office, we had excluded poppers, insecticides, environmental toxins, drugs. The only thing that came up on our computer analysis was sexual activity, degree of sexual activity, variety of sexual activity, and intensity. Now, at this time, we could have gone ahead much more rapidly. We knew where we were looking for. We finally knew that we thought we had, if it's not a new organism, maybe it's a virus, because we tested for every organism we could test for, and they were all negative. It had to be something new. It had to be an infection. It was transmitted from person to person sexually. It was delayed because in order to study these things, you need people who are trained in the laboratory, people who are trained clinicians to, to work with patients, people who are trained in virology to work out a vaccine. We have uh, any, any resources we had. We needed an electron microscope. We needed this, that, and the other. They all take money. You can't hire people unless you can pay their salaries. And you can't go on from there unless you have money for the rest of it. And from the very top, the federal government, I'm sorry, from the very top, the federal government right on down, the feds to the states, the states to the city, they were blocked, one after the other. Okay. I hate this thing. Randy, in the meantime, can you hear me now? Randy, in the meantime, was going to other cities and other countries. He was in Africa. He was in Europe. I wasn't there with him. But what he reported about that I knew in the States was true. I retired in 84, but I continued to talk with Randy. He kept calling for information. And in 85 and 86, he was in my home repeatedly for information for his band book. That was interesting. I asked him, uh, do you need a plug-in for your tape recorder? He said, oh, no, I take it by hand. And he sat there with a whole pile of... Uh, index cards and he just made note after note after note. I couldn't believe that he would be working it that way. He had a wonderful mind. He seemed quiet, polite, conservative in his dress, manner. Inside he was a raging fighter, battling to get his message out. And it wasn't easy because he had to convince his editor and that editor had to convince his supervisor and the supervisor all the way on up and then the top would say, oh no, that's not the kind of thing our readers would like to read. And it didn't get printed for a long time. He had to fight for every, every story. And even after the band was published, we still had resistance. Now, the band made a big splash. It was a, a bestseller. It, it was in all the papers. Movies were made about it. And there was still resistance through the last 12 years of the administrations. The feds and the state and the private conservative organizations, just look outside, they blocked and they prevented funding which would have permitted us to find much sooner an effective prevention, an effective treatment, an effective vaccine for the men, the women, and the babies, including Randy maybe, who might be alive today if not for their active opposition. In Randy's name I say they have much to answer for. San Francisco can be justly proud to have had a son like Randy Schultz, a man who could take his skill as a journalist and in essence write three seminal books that describe major events at the end of the 20th century. The first, the rise of elected political power, gay power in this country. The second, the homophobia that has paralyzed the U.S. military for the last 200 years. And finally, and certainly most important, the book that chronicles the agony and the indifference that characterized the AIDS 
epidemic in its first five years. Randy had that incredible ability to give speech to the agony in the gay community, the fear, the terror, and at the same time hold up a mirror so that straight America could look at itself and see the part that it was playing in this play. Randy was both the voice of gay America and the conscience of straight America. As a physician who cared for Randy and has cared for far too many people dying of AIDS, I must tell you that he was not allowed to wrap the draperies of his couch about him and lie down to pleasant dreams. What Randy faced, what all people with AIDS face, is a nightmare. It is a nightmare of fear, of hopes raised and then dashed by the next study that shows that this drug doesn't work, a nightmare of pain and disfigurement and shortness of breath and cough and death. And in that death, Randy was deprived of seeing what he had created come to fruition, to see the society mobilize against this disease. He was deprived of his old age. And we, we were deprived of his wisdom, his insights, and how many more wonderful books he would have written. What memorial is appropriate for this man. It shouldn't be prose. It shouldn't be stone. It must be action. The time has come. <laughs> the time has come for us to say to the churches of America, preach love, not hate. For unfortunately, my friends, it is on the very altars of many churches of this land that the homophobia that plagues us is born. The time has come to say to the pharmaceutical industry, no more glossy perspectives. We're interested in cures, not profits. And to, the medical, and to the medical and scientific community, enough AIDS profiteering, enough scientists stealing viruses from each other to garner prizes. We are not interested in Nobel Prizes. We are facing a virus that kills every single person in its wake. And finally, we need to say to our elected officials, we're tired of one party using this against another party. We're tired of promises broken. We're tired of being used for political advantage. We want to see action for funding, for prevention, for education, for treatment, and a vaccine to end this terror. If Randy could be here today, this would be his message to you. For us to do less than to call for this level of activism is to betray ourselves, and worse, to betray Randy Schultz. Thank you. Several speakers tonight or today talk about uh, Randy's diligence and his thoroughness. And Selma even talked about his three by, three by eight cards. I remember as he was 
in the middle or towards the conclusion of writing and the band played on uh, he asked me if I'd stop by his flat up uh, by the medical school uh, when I was uh, uh, giving a lecture up there and just go over one final point with, with him. And I walked into his living room and across the entire living room were these cards stacked on end. It must have been 14 feet of all the details he put together and the band played on. Incredible diligence, incredible thoroughness, and incredible speed in getting a job done. To give you an idea how fast Randy does things, I found this letter about his book that he's already written. And, and I'm sorry for, to St. Martin's Press that this is from a new press. Uh, this is uh, from a new publisher. This is called Heavenly Publishing Company. And it's a letter about his book that he has already written, apparently. And I thought I should share that with you today. It says, Dear Randy, thank you for your draft manuscript. I have read it, and I really liked it. But, but it's not exactly the book you agreed to write. You, you stated that you were going to write a book about your Native American ancestry, something about Ishii and, and your roots. But now again, it's just AIDS. The only link I can find to your Native American ancestry is the title, Tribalism and the AIDS Epidemic, Them and Us, played on and on and on. I do like it, but it's just not what I expected. The chapter Condoms in the School, the great cover-up, was my favorite. <laughs> I love the part when the major opposition to making condoms available in the San Francisco school district came from the lesbian leaders who insisted that if men were to have condoms given out, women must be given dental dams. That's a great line, but can it really be true? It was good news for those bent on increasing further HIV transmission among them. For the political advancement of us, but do you expect your readers really to believe it? Your finale of that chapter was where the two school district leaders from San Francisco and from New York City who were really pushing condom availability both lost their jobs. Did that really happen? Are you pulling my leg? I like the chapter on needle exchange, but, but can it really be true that Governor of California again vetoed legislation which would allow evaluation of needle exchange by health departments in the state? You really put it in perspective with a story that Governor Wilson's predecessor, Duke Majin, vetoed the bill requiring California youth to have AIDS education three times. Your comment that he did sign another bill, which instead required the teaching of abstinence to California youth, reassures me that these leaders really have their act together. <laughs> After all, it must be another tribe, the them of your book, who have sex and use drugs, us folks who do not do those things, don't need condoms and cleat needles, do we? Your governors are great. Speaking of them and us, the story of the new director of the Department of Health in San Francisco was a real knee slapper. When the city finds two qualified women to head the health department, one African American and one Latina, I thought you were going to put an end to this white male dominated us social order. Instead, you describe warfare with the black community led by a Christian preacher attacking the health commission's choice of the Latina doctor. I agree with you. Tribalism in your multicultural city hit a new low with that episode. Great story. I liked it. But can that be real? Chapter 5. The gay community chapter sounded like the old days of the band. Gay leaders are opposed to HIV reporting and some still against widespread voluntary testing. When the epidemic is headed towards a million deaths, People are still worried about their, more worried about their civil rights than their health. They want services, but they don't want to be counted. They push for more research dollars to get services instead of pushing for reporting and demanding early intervention for all. Is that it? And the vaccine story, that was great. But is it true that the infected tribe is representing the uninfected tribe of the gay community and complaining that vaccine trials not be undertaken because they take money away from the search for a better treatment? Oh, that's good. If we keep up the, that approach, maybe there won't be enough of us to even have a them or us tribe. Oh, I almost forgot your blood bank chapter. I love the title. Oops. <laughs> there, the them was those unfortunate enough to get blood, and the us were those who collected it. So they just didn't have proof that a transmissible virus was the cause. And the FDA claims that the blood bankers were really self-regulated. Well, you put them in their place. But what about those 20,000 people who will die? Isn't anyone going to consider them 
us. Finally, I love the chapter of the continued saga of Dr. Gallo. So, so the NIH has dropped its investigation of any wrongdoing. Another example of the benefits of self-regulation. I can't understand that. I may not like it, but I can understand it. But the statements of some gay community leaders, I cannot fathom. It can't be true that some leaders of the gay community are rallying behind this infamous virus snatcher with the claim that he has suffered enough for his mistaken claim that he discovered the cause of AIDS. If true, I'm impressed how forgiving some gay leaders can be in the right circumstances. Maybe this is the first sign of the disappearance of the them and us tribalism of AIDS. Maybe all the bad guys and the good guys of the past will soon be under one tent. But I wonder, will that be a tent of all good guys? Or will it be a tent of all bad guys? Oh, who knows? But how can you stand writing about all this shit anyway? Excuse me, Reverend. <laughs> Maybe you should just take a long vacation away from this mess and stand above it all. Wouldn't you rather just sit on a high perch looking down on all this tribal warfare and smile at the antics of the crazed and the spiteful? From that perch, maybe I can convince you to write me the next book, perhaps a comedy, perhaps tribalism, a comical view from on high, or them and us on other short war stories. Or, or yet, maybe better, you should just sit on your perch and watch with that great smile of yours. Yeah, that's the best. Just watch those folks down there and smile. Randy, we need that smile. Thank you. I met Randy Schultz for the first time in 1983. We were introduced by Pat Hope, our mutual friend, and Randy's colleague at the Chronicle, where she was and is today the editor of the book review. Randy Schultz, by name, was not unknown to me. He had published a moving biography of Harvey Milk, a book I was familiar with, and for many months I had been reading and admiring his AIDS reporting for the Chronicle. I myself had just a few years before, and with some trepidation, struck out my shingle as a literary agent. I was looking for clients, he was looking for an agent, and he was beginning work on a new book. He thought it might be a very important book, and for a journalist he told me it was the story of a lifetime. It was also possible that he was the only man in the country able to write this book. We made a date to meet at my office four-story Victorian walk-up on Union Street. I remember he was there on the dot. I heard him bounding up the four flights, taking them two stairs at a time, and I said to myself that here was a man in a hurry. We met at the top of the stairs. Hi, he said, reaching out his hand. You're Fred Hill. I'm Randy Schultz. We shook hands and sat down to business. There's no time for small talk. And we talked for a long time that first meeting about his work at the Chronicle, his years in Portland at journalism school, his brief stint for the ad advocate, about his ambitions for a career in journalism, and of course about this big story he felt compelled to write, whatever it might cost him. I think he talked faster and more convincingly than any man I'd ever met. If he hadn't chosen a Noberg calling, what an agent he would have made. <laughs> it was as if his thoughts were clearly and perfectly registered at the very moment he articulated them. When he, caused, when he paused to catch his breath, his eyes kept talking. They never, he never averted his gaze from you. By the end of our meeting, he would be my client. I would be his literary agent. And over the next 11 years, we would become friends as well as allies. The story he came to talk to me about would be published four years later after thousands of interviews, hundreds of hours of research, and tens of thousands of miles traveled. It was a monumental undertaking for a 33-year-old reporter with one book under his belt. It would be called and the band played on, and it would become, <clears throat> by many accounts, 
one of the most powerful examples of investigative journalism to be published <coughs> in our time. It catapulted the author to the front ranks of his profession and it brought him international celebrity. But for all the recognition of his accomplishment, there was a disquieting side to all of this that he kept pretty much to himself until 1989, when in an essay entitled Talking AIDS to Death, published in Esquire magazine, Randy speculated with disarming candor as to whether his work had really made a difference. It is a disturbing essay, a brilliant essay in fact, and maybe at least for me, the best writing he ever did. It was one of the rare opportunities he had as a journalist to express his own feelings in print. The piece has subsequently been widely anthologized in collections of best essays and high school textbooks. I should like to read you a brief excerpt from it. I had written a book to change the world and here I was on talk shows throughout America answering questions about mosquitoes and gay waiters. This wasn't exactly what I had envisioned when I began writing and the band played on. I had uh, hoped to affect some fundamental changes. I really believed I could alter the performance of the institutions that had allowed AIDS to sweep through America unchecked. The bitter irony is, my role as an AIDS celebrity just gives me a more elevated promontory from which to watch the world make the same mistakes in the handling of the AIDS epidemic that I had hoped my work would help to change. When I return from network tapings and celebrity glad handing, I come back to my home in San Francisco's gay community and see friends dying. The lesions spread from their cheeks to cover their faces their hair falls out, they die slowly, horribly, and sometimes suddenly, before anybody has a chance to know they're sick. They die in my arms and in my dreams, and nothing at all has changed. Never before have I succeeded so well. Never before have I failed so miserably. Last year, at the height of the debate, Randy published Conduct Unbecoming, another monumental undertaking against nearly insuperable odds it took three years to complete. In a front page review in USA Today, the distinguished Pulitzer Prize winning journalist critic Gary Wills in his review compares the urgency of Randy's book to the works of Rachel Carson and Betty Friedan. No fair-minded person can read Conduct Unbecoming and consider the present system defensible. Randy loved that review and the interview he subsequently had with Wills which appeared in Rolling Stone. But it was hard to reconcile the, consist the consistently thoughtful and admiring reviews from every corner of the country with, with the administration's abrupt decision to step away from what Randy would call a black and white promise. He was older now and tired and fighting for his life. It didn't hurt quite as much as the first time. Still, was all this work, this fierce dedication to unearthing the truth, was it really making a difference? I spent the weekend rereading some old reviews and, and interviews I watched him on, sun, on uh, 60 Minutes Sunday night. I remembered all the times I had seen him on Night Beat or the 6 o'clock news, or on one program or another. I remembered the screenings of, uh, and the band played on in San Francisco and Los Angeles, the standing ovations. I was reminded of the fact that his essays will be read by hundreds of thousands of high school kids that his books would be read by hundreds of thousands more, not only in this country, but in many foreign countries. I had to be reminded again that he had touched so many people. And then here, if 
only he could see the crowd. He would love it. Uh, I think, Randy, we can safely say that you made a very big difference. His books, his essays, his superb character, his courage, his unflinching honesty are his gift to us. As Selma said, it's his legacy. We're its guardians. It's up to us now to make sure that it continues to make a difference. Randy allowed each of us to be proud of our diversity. His contributions will impact social evolution throughout eternity. I'm here to say farewell to Randy for myself and as a spokesperson for thousands of lesbian and gay journalists across this country who owe him an enormous debt. In the introduction of his book about Harvey Milk, Randy wrote the following. There are times, rare times, when the forces of social change collide with a series of dramatic events which are later called historic. Just such a time fell in San Francisco during the late 1970s. The tide of history that briefly swept the country included dramatic scenarios of assassinations, rioting, political intrigue, and angry street demonstrations. But most significantly, San Francisco became the national vortex for the aspirations of a new movement, which is only now coming of age, the gay movement. And Randy Schultz became the chronicler of that movement, actually the second wave of the gay movement of the last 15 years. Fearlessly, aggressively, meticulously, in newspaper and in books, he reported, analyzed, explained, and influenced the perception of the incredible seismic events of the gay culture that rocked and shook our society. He could not have known when he wrote the Milk Book that he would be in the vanguard of journalists who struggled to alert the world of the deadly scourge of AIDS, or that he himself, less than two decades later, would be claimed by the virus. Any journalist working in journalism today who is gay or lesbian owes an enormous debt to Randy Schultz. It was Randy who jumped out front publicly and said, I'm gay and I'm good enough to work beside any professional yet who struggled for years and considered quitting the profession before finding a mainstream paper with the guts to hire an openly gay reporter. It was Randy who carved out the gay beat and went on to demonstrate that you can be gay, cover the gay story, and be fair and responsible. It was Randy who first put the gay story in a newspaper on a daily basis and onto page one, something it took the rest of the profession more than a deca decade to catch up with. It was Randy who demonstrated that a journalist's first obligation is to honest reporting, even if it meant gaining the enmity of those who assumed that a gay reporter would automatically follow a particular political line. 
It took many of us a considerable time to follow Randy's footprints. It wasn't until the 90s, in fact, that hundreds of gay journalists began stepping from the shadows to assert their identities and demand that the lip service dedication in mainstream journalists and ju journalism to journalistic principles be applied fairly and equally to those of the gay and lesbian community. And as we did, it was Randy's example we followed and in whose path of victories we trod. And what made it easier for us was the fact that he and a few other pioneers had convinced their editors by example that centuries of distorted coverage, stereotyping, and invisibility had contributed to misperceptions and hatred of gays and were bad journalism. So, the National Lesbian and Gay Journalists Association, which I represent, emerged with Randy's help and encouragement so that closeted journalists ready to step forward can gain encouragement from the example of their colleagues. So that now nearly a thousand mostly out gay and lesbian journalists are involved across the country. And what they are doing is carrying on Randy's work. They are carrying on in the face of efforts by the religious right to discredit gay and lesbian journalists and intimidate their news managers. And as we carry on, Randy's memory and his work will be a shining beacon of what is possible, a beacon of hope and optimism that honesty, fairness, and outstanding professionalism is capable of changing the world. Randy wrote in the acknowledgement section of And the Band Played On that he will always bear special reverence for those suffering from AIDS who gave some of their last hours for interviews while they were on their deathbeds laboring for breath. Quote, when I'd ask why, most hoped that something they said would save someone else from suffering. If there is an act that better defines heroism, I have not seen it, unquote. Randy fits that description. Goodbye, Randy. If there is a person that better defines heroism, I have not seen one. Thank you. If you don't know, I'm the preacher. <laughs> Randy went to Africa with us from five or six years ago. Or more than that. Whatever, whatever they did was. We, he went to Africa with a delegation from San Francisco. We were setting up a sister city relationship with Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, better known in some annals as the Gold Coast. Randy talked a lot on that trip. <laughs> and I said, you know, I said to him one day, I said, man, I've never seen anybody talk as much as you do and write at the same time. He and I had a disagreement on the trip about opulence, the leader of the country and his opulence, you know. And after we finished our disagreement, we laughed and embraced. Randy was on a journey, if you don't know that. And his journey was to create not only a vision of what people could do together if in fact they wanted to solve one of the most deadly problems of our time, but his, his tenacity, his motivation, his insistence, his pushing, his day and night work says something about the fact that he was trying to get at what we call the root of the matter. And if you get at the root of the matter, 
you get it what is called uh, uh, radix, R-A-D-I-X, and radix means radical. And now you, we're talking about maybe the fact that he was he was a he was a journalist first, and many other facts facts. But to me, one of these days somebody's going to say Randy was a revolutionary. You know why? Because he set the pace for curing, hopefully, and healing a, a whole, not only nation, but an entire world. When you get at the root of the matter, you're not trying to destroy anything. A revolutionary never destroys, as far as I'm concerned. Builds up, creates, discovers, has vision, insight, perception about where he or she is going. And that's what this beautiful, beautiful person had, was that kind of perception and vision. We are going to, one of these days, say that Randy changed the course of history. You watch. We're going to say it one of these days. I know, I know, it's, I know it's difficult now, because we still got a lot of folks around like the Reverend Phelps, but that is difficult. The second thing I think that we should be aware of is that uh, he is a person who was ahead of his time. See, if you're going to be a pioneer, if you're going to be on the cutting edge, you've got to be ahead of your time. There are folks still trying to catch up with Randy. And we'll never catch up with Randy. You know, and I think it's about time for us to realize that he was far ahead of his time. The third thing is that Randy worked with people suffering people, people in pain, people who were hurting, people who were in need. Randy worked with people. He worked with people so that he could inform, so that he could engage, and so that he could hopefully resolve some of the problems that people were facing. Randy finally gave us a wake-up call. First of all, to many of you and many of us, a wake-up call. Remember, though, there are still people who are so out of touch with the reality of their sexuality, they, they're not going to accept Randy and the contribution he made. But you might as well understand that one of these days, all, not only the closet doors are going to be open, but all of those who denied the fact that they did not want homosexuals around, as they would say. If they don't want them around, then what they got to do is put them down. Well, I'm going to tell you something. The more you put homosexuals down, the better and the more they come up. You hear me? talking about. You've been through the fire before. You've been rejected before. You've been put down before. You've been afraid before. You've held your breath and hoped that nobody would find out before. But now the time is rapidly the coming where you don't care if anybody knows. Because if you're going to live your life, you got to live it fully. Randy, I want you to hear me now. I'll talk to you just a minute. When we left you in Africa, I was afraid that you wasn't going to get back, brother. But you made it back, didn't you? And you brought your information back, didn't you? And you informed us, didn't you? And you kept on telling us and helping us to discover understand, to see better, to know that darkness was not only the way uninformed people would soon, sooner or later, begin to understand that there is a spirit among humanity, 
And if you uncap the spirit, call it whatever you want to. When it's uncapped, it becomes contagious. And when it becomes contagious, you get the disease of spirit also. It's a spirit of love and a spirit of concern and a spirit of caring and a spirit of doing what is natural and authentic. It is a spirit that says to all of us, justice and love will kiss. And when justice and love kiss, something's going to happen, brothers and sisters. So much so that I had to say to Reverend Phelps when he sent me a letter late last night trying to, to see he, his strategy. Let me tell you what his strategy was. His strategy was, if I got a letter late last night, and he's inviting me to meet him out there somewhere, out there, and, and have, he wants to shake my hand and pray with me, well, I know fundamentalists, if they start praying, they, you know, they just pray on and on. First, I wasn't going to get caught in that trap. But his strategy was to make me not be able to respond to him in time. So when he came this morning, you see, he would be able to say, well, I asked the Reverend Cecil Williams to come and greet me, and, and, and he won't do it because he is uh, exclusive and because he doesn't have any scripture in his life. Not like he is anyway. But anyway, he said... I know what he was trying to do, and finally, let me say this, what he was trying to do is go against this very person. He had said of Randy, Randy's going to burn in hell. Well, Brother Phelps, let me tell you something. There's another hell waiting for you. heaven, Randy, I know where you are. You're there, brother. And I know you're with a whole cloud of witnesses who have died of AIDS. And, and I know now they are thanking you for writing and informing and giving the knowledge and dedicating yourself. They're there now waiting, Randy, as they greet you. But we here who are still alive greet you also with this, this celebration of your life. Randy, I want you to know, we will not only not forget you, but every time we get a chance, we're going to do some of the things that you did. We're going to keep in your pathway. We're going to work and, and, and come together and, and have coalitions because it's time for people to understand whether they're black Baptist ministers or white Baptist ministers or a uh, 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 yellow or uh, green or uh, whatever color. They need to know that what they are espousing will never, never work. As Martin King says, Amen. that love, love never gives out. Love wins all time. We will win. community and lesbian community to know that you stop feeling ashamed. Stop feeling guilty. You are who you are. And I want to quote the scripture now. God said, I am who I am. And the prophets picked up on that. And you got to stand up and say, I am who I am. I'm gay, and I'm lesbian, and I'm bisexual, and I'm trisexual, and I'm anisexual. Go on. You know? And I bring you then the love that comes to us. Thank you so very much for coming this way. 
I want you to know that this is one church that's open. There may be other churches that will close their doors because of somebody who's got AIDS. But we don't worry about AIDS here. We just keep working, trying to make sure that people get the proper information. Thank you, Randy, for leading us. The other band played on. You were the drum major who told us to look and turn around and go for it. Thank you, drum major, like King. I know somebody's going to say, like King. Yes, like King. Martin King. Thank you, my man. Thank you. Thank you, my brother. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The family wishes to thank Linda Albine for her amazing and coordinating this celebration of Randy Schultz today. Thank you, Linda. Linda. Now, here's what we're going to do, brothers and sisters. We're going to stand and be silent for a moment and hold each other's hands. And then we'd like for, after for a minute, when I say it, we're through, for the family and friends and workers and the speakers to go out this side and go down to our reception hall, Freedom Hall, for reception. And you, you are invited also. And we'll just keep eating until we run out of food. Uh, let's hold hands at this point. Thank you, Randy. Thank you for your life, Randy. Thank you. Thank you, 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 brother. Thank you. Amen. Hallelujah. Right on. Shalom. Salam. <laughs>